All right. All right. Yes, indeed. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. It's great to see everyone. Welcome to another MAA Virtual Distinguished Lecture. We have another great program scheduled for everyone tonight. So looking forward to getting into that. Uh, Michael, can you believe MathFest is just around the corner? I <laughs> feel like we've been planning it forever and it's 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 right upon us. So after almost three years, finally going to get to come back together. And I was just realizing that uh, we have a great talk tonight uh, that's going to be talking about modeling biological systems with mathematics. And at um, MathFest in Philadelphia, we'll have uh, Suzanne Linhart from the University of Tennessee right. as Hedrick Lecturer talking about that topic as well. So uh, all you folks who find this topic fascinating as I do, I hope you'll join us. Definitely a topic that's trending. And a reminder that after tomorrow, prices are going to go up. Registration is going to go up slightly um, starting July 1. So if you plan to attend MathFest, please be sure to register by tomorrow and make sure you get that hotel room booked. And we are really excited to see everyone this year. Yeah. But um, we should go ahead and get started. We, uh, apologies, we're just a little late, but let's go ahead and get, get started with uh, tonight's lecture. Hello, Sarah. Hi, Michael. How's it going? It's going it's great. To great to have you here tonight. We're uh, pleased to uh, host these distinguished lectures, and it's great to have, have you join us tonight. Yeah, so, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here, too. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Del Valle is at Los Alamos uh, National Labs. And uh, I know many of us grew up thinking of the national labs as being associated with uh, our nuclear weapons programs. But in fact, the national labs have a diverse and rich scientific program across lots of different areas. And we're gonna hear about some of that tonight from Dr. Del Valle. And let me just uh, say a couple of things, Sarah, if you don't mind. Um, you are a senior scientist in the information systems and modeling group at Los Alamos, and you lead a multidisciplinary team focused on detecting, understanding, and forecasting infectious disease diseases using heterogeneous data streams and mathematical, computational, and statistical models. Sarah, you attended uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology as an undergraduate, but I understand that you uh, as an undergraduate, you went to uh, Carlos Castillo Chavez's REU at Cornell, a very famous REU where lots of folks were inspired to study further in math and biology. And Absolutely. you then went on to Iowa, uh, University of Iowa and uh, got your PhD. And uh, Dr. Del Valle uh, developed mathematical models to describe outbreaks of smallpox at the time and has uh, been, since completing our doctorate, has been at Los Alamos, and we're delighted to have you here tonight. Your work has been featured in a number of national uh, outlets, including uh, NPR and the New York Times, and last year I was really pleased, in fact, I'm partway through it, but I haven't finished it yet, uh, that you were one of the featured scientists in the PBS documentary, vaccination from the misinformation virus, where you're applying your modeling skills to think about not just diseases in the traditional sense, but misinformation, which we know is a, a big problem. So it's going to be great to hear your talk tonight. Anything um, we can, anything you'd like to add to what I said before I turn it over to you? No, I, I think uh, you covered um, you know, most of it. And I'm really excited to be here. And I've listened to the other distinguished lectures and it was a lot of fun. And I really love the diversity in terms of the, the mathematicians that you're featuring. So I'm, I'm really excited to talk about infectious diseases since uh, COVID has pl uh, played a big role in our lives in the last two years. So yeah. I'm excited to talk about well, the role of math in that. I'm looking forward to hearing it, and I will, without further ado, well, oh, let me mention, for those of you in the audience, please, if you have questions, put them in the chat, 
At the end, I'll come back and we'll do a little Q&A and have time for that. So without further ado, Sarah, the show is yours. Thank you, Michael. Well, thanks everyone for, um, for being here and thank you to the MAA for um, asking me to join this lecture series. Um, as Michael mentioned, I'm um, Sarah Del Valle and my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a scientist at Los Alamos. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. So I wanted to start with um, the outline just so that you can kind of see um, what, what's coming. Um, I wanna start with my career journey and, um, and then uh, talk a, a little bit about the history of epidemic modeling, then move into how we include uh, human behavior in epidemic models, model, models, which is the main topic of my presentation, and finally have some concluding remarks. Um, so the reason why I wanted to start with my journey is because many mathematicians don't think of uh, national labs as a potential career option. And um, especially, I think, uh, given Michael's introduction, there's a, a misconception that um, the national labs are, you know, fo focused on, on nuclear weapons and nuclear research, although that is um, one part of the research that that happens here and i think there's a lot um, there's a lot of diversity and um, i will um, cover my journey and how i ended up here at los alamos so i wanted to kind of start with uh, my early years um, i was born in mexico and i'm the youngest of three um, my parents are pastors and so i was a, a preacher's kid or a pk and uh, my parents denomination basically uh, moved my parents everywhere um, in, they they tended to move the pastors around uh, the uh, different states within Mexico, and so one of the early things that I learned as a child was adaptability. Um, I I always talk about how I think I did my uh, elementary school in three different states, uh, junior high school in two different uh, schools, and then um, high school in two different countries. And so I learned about being adaptable and kind of um, not being afraid of starting, I guess, from scratch. And so that's something that has helped me uh, throughout my years. And then one other thing that I think um, we'll, I will talk about this later, it's about making an impact. And I think this was something that um, was ingrained in me and my parents always felt that whatever you do, you need to be very intentional about your decisions and always kind of making sure that you are um, making the world better and, and making an impact. Um, so I moved to the US when I was uh, 16 and I finished high school here. And one of my first uh, challenges was to learn a new language because I didn't really know any English. And so um, that was a challenge, but it was um, because I have I mentioned how I've always kind of been adaptable, I kind of um, figure how to manage to get through that. Um, then the other challenge that I had was navigating the college admissions. Um, it was a very uh, complicated process and my parents didn't know English and so I had to rely on mentors and thankfully I found both my pre-calculus and my calculus uh, teachers at, uh, in my high school that were very instrumental and kind of helped me navigate um, the um, the process. And so um, they suggested going to NJIT because I really like math. Um, and even though I didn't really know what I was going to do with math, um, they figure that an Institute of Technology would provide the STEM education that I wanted. And so I originally majored in engineering, um, but then later on I decided to switch to math just because math always came more naturally to me and um, and I figured um, that I would enjoy majoring in math. Um, one thing that I always kind of talk about about my college years is that they were also able to diversify my network. I um, I know that I, um, I I grew up in a very kind of conservative family, but the um, my college years allow me to kind of uh, be exposed to a lot of different types of people, backgrounds, religions, and, and so that was really helpful and that's been uh, super helpful. 
um, now. Um, one thing that I also, um, in college, I always thought I would be a math professor because I, that's what I thought all mathematicians did. Um, and we'll come back to that later. And um, also uh, during my college years, I found a mentor, which was Professor uh, Burke Tilly, who was very also helpful in kind of helping me navigate um, college. So I, as Michael mentioned, I, during my undergrad, I attended um, an REU program, which is a research experience for undergraduates, um, MTBI uh, at Cornell University. And um, this internship was pivotal in, in kind of helping me identify what I wanted to do and also helping me um, uh, think about uh, the impact that I, how I wanted to use math uh, to make an impact. And so this uh, MTBI, which stands for Mathematical Theoretical uh, Biology Institute, is a, um, a summer program that focuses on mathematical epidemiology. And um, they provide a lot of mentorship and also uh, network, ne uh, networking opportunities. And so I, that was one of the first times that I um, was able to go to conferences and show my research. And I think all of these di different pieces uh, played a big role in, in my, my journey. Um, as, as a result of this uh, summer program, I decided to pursue graduate school and to get a PhD in applied mathematics. And um, I met my PhD advisor, uh, Professor Herbert Hethcote at Cornell. He was actually helping uh, Carlos Castillo Chavez with the summer program. And so um, that's why I ended up going to the University of Iowa, even though he was a uh, professor at the University of Iowa, he uh, was helping with the summer program. And um, while I was, um, after I had completed my coursework at the University of Iowa, I, um, I got invited by, by Carlos to come to Los Alamos. He got a one year appointment um, as a visiting scientist and uh, he was going to bring all his uh, graduate students from Cornell to Los Alamos, and he asked me to join. And um, and so I joined here as a as a graduate student, and um, and then I also found another mentor, uh, Matt Kaiman, while working here at Los Alamos. And so at Los Alamos, um, I came here as a graduate student, and even though I was supposed to be here just for a year. Um, I ended up staying and that was in 2003. And so next year is going to be 20 years since I've been, um, I started working here at Los Alamos. And then uh, once I graduated, I um, did a postdoc. Then I was, um, I became a scientist. And in 2016, I did a short stint as a deputy group leader. Uh, but last year I went back to uh, being um, a scientist and now I'm a, a senior scientist. Um, and during my my time here at Los Alamos, I got married. I had a baby girl, and uh, we used to have two dogs. Uh, they both passed away, and now we have uh, two other dogs. And so, some of the takeaways I think um, for me um, have been to take chances. I think um, it's sometimes it's, it can be scary to go and do an internship at a place that you don't know. Um, given that you might be comfortable with um, with the location where you are, but I think um, taking chances can always lead to maybe new opportunities. And so I really encourage everyone to, to take chances. Uh, one other thing is to follow your passion. Um, this is something that Matt Kaiman has always emphasized. And um, in my case, I think uh, applying mathematics to epidemics has been a, a passion for me. And I think being able to contribute to many different pandemics from um, the current COVID-19 to Ebola, chikungunya, and influenza and many others. And so it's, it's always kind of great to, um, to be able to contribute to um, what's happening around the globe. And um, a couple of other values is collaboration and networking. And this is something that is uh, very important. And I also highly recommend uh, students who may be listening to this lecture um, that collaboration and networking uh, can help you uh, achieve your goals. And then um, one other thing which kind of goes full circle into my early years is about uh, trying to make an impact. And for me, um, helping with um, mitigating the spread of, of COVID-19 and many other infectious diseases has always given me, uh, has fulfilled my desire to make an impact. And so, 
Um, I, I mentioned I'm at, you know, I'm at Los Alamos National Lab. And so I kind of wanted to, um, in, for those of you who don't know what the national labs are, um, they, these are facilities um, overseen by the Department of Energy and the purpose is to advance science and technology to fulfill um, the Department of Energy's mission. And as you can see here, um, there are kind of three different types of, of national labs. There's the Office of Science, labs, there are other labs, and there is the National uh, Nuclear Security Administration lab, which is um, Los Alamos is one of the NNSA labs. Um, and then in terms of um, Los Alamos is specifically, not just the, the system of, of national labs, we are uh, located in Los Alamos, New Mexico, which is uh, in the high desert of northern uh, New Mexico. Um, it, the lab was established in 1943 around, um, you know, during the World War II in the original uh, purpose of it was to design nuclear weapons. But now the mission has expanded and our, goal, our mission is to solve national security challenges through scientific excellence. And obviously infectious diseases are one uh, national security challenge. And so that's why we study epidemics and many other um, problems like, such as climate change. Um, it's, uh, we have, you know, over 14,000 uh, employees and uh, over, you know, between 1,000 and 2,000, over 2,000 uh, students and postdocs. And for those of you who have watched Breaking Bad or, or like Breaking Bad, we're about 100 miles from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where uh, Breaking Bad was um, shot. So um, also, I just wanted to quickly cover some um, opportunities for uh, students, postdocs, and also professors. We have a lot of different uh, student opportunities from for undergraduate, for uh, bachelor's, uh, master's, uh, PhD students, um, also a lot of different postdoctoral positions. Um, and university professors, we also have like short-term visiting appointments or year-round appointments and uh, sabbaticals. And so um, there's a lot of opportunities if people are interested in, in joining uh, the National Lab or just coming to visit to see um, some of the research that's going on here. And also I wanted to mention that there's, we have a lot of different summer uh, schools um, where students can participate in, and, and I mentioned some of them here. Okay, so um, I was going to show this video, but it's not working and the audio is not working. And so I'm just going to, um, this video basically um, talks about, it. this is uh, from National Geographic and it was just describing how uh, here at Los Alamos, we have been developing large computer simulations to study epidemics. And um, these computer simulations basically have been used in, in response to many different um, national emergencies from like H1N1 and uh, to to now COVID-19. And so um, and so basically we're just kind of talking about how we're using mathematics and compute and computational sciences to study epidemics. But um, so I'm just going to go now into the history of pandemics and I wanted to kind of highlight um, this because many people think that maybe, you know, the COVID-19 has been maybe the first pandemic, but um, in reality, humans and infections have coexisted throughout history. And here um, you can see the death toll from many different pandemics. And, and, and you can see that there's uh, everything from the bubonic plague to smallpox to cholera, uh, the Spanish flu, HIV AIDS, and obviously more recently COVID-19. And many of them have had uh, very high tolls, death tolls. And um, also I wanted to mention that I'll, I'll go into a little bit more detail this uh, later, but there's early evidence of epidemic models uh, being developed in this or in the 1500s. Um, and so one thing that I wanted to highlight is um, the different transmission routes. And this is gonna be important because uh, when we're developing models, uh, we need to account for how disease transmits so we can describe it in in a mathematical kind of uh, way and so as you can see here um, there's been many different ways in which we can uh, become infected from obviously person to person which is how flu or covid um, is uh, usually transmitted 
but there's many other ways. And so there's, um, you can get infected through animals or insects and this is uh, for the plague or uh, malaria or dengue, which is transmitted to mosquitoes. Also, um, uh, we mentioned, or I mentioned cholera as, as one of the pandemics that uh, we, we had um, in, in past history. And this is usually transmitted through uh, contaminated water but you can also get you know, salmonella, for example, through contaminated food. And there's also sexually transmitted diseases, uh, which is um, you know, HIV AIDS, or even more recently, uh, monkeypox. And so you can see that depending on the uh, transmission route, the, the models that we develop will have to somehow uh, account for those differences so that we can um, better describe the dynamics and also uh, help decision makers um, find the, the best mitigation strategies. Um, my presentation is going to focus on person to person um, uh, transmission routes. And so, but we, uh, we also work with other types of models. And so um, here's a kind of a timeline of some of the history of the epidemic modeling. And this is like in the, the early uh, stages of epidemic modeling, obviously now there's a lot more sophisticated uh, epidemic model or models. But I wanted to just kind of highlight, um, you know, that in the 1500s, they, you, there's evidence that John Grant used um, different, uh, he collected information to, to kind of determine the cause of, of, of uh, mortality for different people. Uh, Bernoulli in the 1700s, um, there's, he started working on um, inoculation of smallpox. Um, John Snow, I, many people are probably familiar with, with this um, story about how he was able to uh, map all the people that were infected uh, with cholera in the UK, in London, and, and he was able to pinpoint a water pump um, as the, the cause of cholera for all those people. Um, that were in, um, impacted, and you know, and then we see models for typhoid and then malaria with uh, Sir Ross, and and actually um, these models for malaria were the one, the first ones to introduce the concept of the reproductive number, and so what's the threshold? That you, how many um, how many mosquitoes do you need to uh, basically get rid of in order to um, to basically mitigate the spread of malaria? And, and then most recently uh, in the uh, early 1900s, uh, Kermack and McHenry um, introduced the, the concept that we currently use for describing the transmission of communicable diseases or diseases that are transmitted from person to person. And so um, I wanted to start from the beginning in case uh, some people are not familiar with um, epidemiological modeling. But uh, this is basically um, the basis of a lot of our, our modeling. So we uh, break the population into three different compartments. We have susceptibles, um, infectious, and recovered individuals. And we assume that the rate at which uh, susceptibles uh, move to an infect the infected class is uh, described by lambda. And then the rate at which uh, people move from the infect in infectious class to the recovered class is uh, represented by delta. And so this is um, this very basic concept can be described as a system of differential equations, and you can see the system of differential equations here. And um, there's kind of two important pieces of information here in in uh, in this model. One is uh, lambda, or uh, is also co called the force of infection, and and I'll go into a little bit more detail later. But um, this the force of infection is basically. Um, the product of, of three different things if you want to just um, kind of simplify it. And so basically it's contacts, the transmission, which is um, represented by beta, and then um, I. And so basically you, when, when you put a lambda back in the, in the system of differential equation, you have the product of S and I. And so that's when a susceptible person comes in contact with an infect, infected or infectious person then that's how that person will move to the infectious class. And um, I'm not gonna talk about the reproductive number, which is R0 or R0, which um, is, is shown here, but um, this is a very important threshold that tells you the severity of an, uh, an outbreak or an epidemic or a pandemic. And 
the larger this number, it represents uh, on average how many secondary infections in uh, a single infected individual will generate. And so um, this number is very important in um, trying to basically understand the uh, um, how you can mitigate this, the spread of an infectious disease. And so if you, um, if you use some parameters, if you make some assumptions about delta and C and beta, then you can basically solve your system of differential equations and then you're gonna get something um, similar to this. And I don't know if it's easy for you to see, but basically um, the, the Y axis goes up to 1000 and then here you have time on the X axis. And you can see that I started with um, 1000 susceptible people and by time, I don't know, about 45, uh, everyone had already been infected, which is uh, represented by this red curve, or uh, had recovered. And so this is um, basically the, the most basic SIR uh, model. But there's one fundamental assumption and limitation on, on all these um, epidemic models. And the, the assumption and limitation is homogeneous mixing. So let me go back to my, um, my system, uh, uh, the complemental model that I described. So we, when we break the population into three compartments, we, uh, we assume that everyone is the same basically. And so we say, okay, um, in the absence of uh, heterogeneity in a population, let's just put everyone in the susceptible class infected and recovered. And then if you wanted to represent that homogeneous mixing assumption in a network model, which is uh, shown here. I have like green nodes uh, represent susceptible people, red nodes represent uh, infected people, and then purple nodes represent uh, recovered people. Um, the homogeneous mixing assumption basically assumes that everyone is connected with everybody. And you can kind of see how that doesn't quite uh, fit in, uh, in the real world because not where, you know, even in my community or my neighborhood, I'm not really connected with everybody. I'm pro I probably have more contacts with my family or with my colleagues at work. And so therefore this assumption, uh, it's not, doesn't quite capture what happens in reality. And what we really need is heterogeneous mixing. And so here I have um, the same kind of nodes, but then instead of assuming that everyone is connected with everybody, I've I've made assumptions about, you know, some people are connected with certain people and some others are not are connected with other people. And then you can see that you are able to kind of um, mitigate the spread of, of, uh, of an, an outbreak here uh, because some of the people that you are connected with are already have already recovered, for example. And so then you're able to mitigate the spread. And so um, one question I had for, for folks um, online uh, was, why do you think um, introducing human behavior and heterogeneity in models is important? And I don't know um, if people can, uh, can type on the chat and, and to just kind of, I wanted to hear if people have thought about um, why we can't just keep using this um, SIR type models without incorporating behavior. And so if, if anyone has uh, some thoughts about why they think uh, we should incorporate human behavior and heterogeneity, uh, please uh, post it on the chat. So let me see if I can, uh, okay. I don't see um, any, and so I'm just gonna move and, um, and so kind of talk about some, some behaviors and then I'll, I'll show you why there it's important to incorporate behavior. Um, and so going back to the 1918 pandemic, some of the same mitigation strategies that we saw during the COVID-19 pandemic were actually implemented then, such as wearing face masks, avoiding crowds, and um, you know, kind of encouraging people to have public gatherings as well as relaxation of, of mandates. And one of the important things that you see that happened during the, that, uh, the 1918 pandemic was this um, emergence of waves. And uh, if people thought that, you know, oh, maybe what happened, the reason why we saw waves was because uh, seasonality. And so, you know, in the winter, we usually have flu. And so that's why, um, that's why we saw this, um, this kind of pattern. 
However, if you um, if you look at these arrows that I I drew here, basically uh, you should have expected like um, a more normal epidemic curve during the seasonality transmission. But in in turn in uh, in turn we saw um, different kind of patterns, and um, it's speculated that this was actually a result of behavioral changes and basically. Um, there were also relaxation once they everyone saw that the pandemic was coming down then people kind of relaxed um the same thing we saw we've seen during the covid 19 um, pandemic and you know lockdowns and pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions and once again we've seen the emergence of, of different waves and so um incorporating behavior and heterogeneity can actually instead of just giving you one uh, epidemic wave then you're able to capture these types of dynamics and uh, depending on different assumptions and so one way uh, we introduce um, basically uh, heterogeneity and human behavior and epidemic models is through um, this uh, the force of infection and one way is basically by um, kind of modifying the contacts and so if we go back to the SIR model um, uh, and uh, a modification that we can make on that model is by basically, instead of just breaking the entire population into three compartments, we can break them up into six compartments. And then you can assume that um, the, the sub B um, compartments that are people that are, are uh, changing their behavior or wearing a face mask or staying home, and basically their contacts are lower. And then the people who don't change their behavior are um have more contacts and then they um they basically um have a, a higher risk basic of, of infection and so the way uh okay oh one one thing that i wanted to mention here is this uh fee term and so basically you assume that people move back and forth between the um the behavior and the non-behavior um uh, classes and then this fee, you can make many different assumptions. You can assume that it's constant, for example, or you can assume different uh, types of functions. We have seen in the past that, and I think it's kind of hard probably to see, but basically um, risk perception changes as a function of, of time and as a function of uh, the cases in a population. And so basically when the number of cases go up, people tend to change their behavior more then when the cases go down, then people stop basically uh, changing their behavior. And so we've used many different uh, functions to capture that movement. And so when you introduce behavior in your model, then you're able to re reproduce this kind of waves that I was um, that we've seen in many different um, uh, previously epidemics and during the, the COVID-19. And so um, these waves uh, are in this case are a function of, of the uh, of behavior, but you can also imagine that some of the, the waves could also be a function of, of the variance. Um, and so another way that we've also introduced uh, behavior in a heterogeneity is um, it's, we could also break it into by age. And we know that different age groups have different contact patterns. For example, children probably maybe have a lot of contact patterns at school and maybe uh, older populations have less contacts, and so then uh, you can introduce that heterogeneity in your um, in your model. the The problem, or not the problem, but the the main the issue with uh, age um, structure models is that you need contact patterns between different age groups, and so basically, I need to know how S one is mixing with S two, with S three, with S four. And so you have to come up with some kind of matrix that describes the mixing um, and the contact patterns across the different age groups. And uh, we've done some, uh, through simulations, we have estimated contact patterns. And here I'm showing uh, the contact patterns for different age groups. And um, on the right, I'm showing the, um, the, the simulations uh, for the different age groups. And so you can see age 20, age 50, age 65, and age 85. Um, and you can see that the um, the epidemic curve looks different for each of the age groups, and it's ba basically based on their contact patterns and how they're mixing with other populations. And so, when you introduce heterogeneity and human behavior in your models, you're able to um, 
more accurately kind of replicate what you see in the real world as opposed to um, just kind of having, um, you know, a, a single kind of epidemic wave where every, everything kind of happens in, in a similar way. Um, another way that we could also introduce behavior in an uh, in, in epidemic model is by basically modifying the beta and this the probability of this is transmission per unit is uh, per unit time can be it's a combination of a lot of different things from susceptibility of an inf uh, uninfected person the effectivity of the infected person and we know that everybody has different viral loads um, the duration of the contact uh, variance and so um, we um, we can do many different things in an epidemic model to to capture this uh, heterogeneity and so here um, I'm showing another epidemic model where we have not just, we have two classes. Uh, there's some people with behavior or wearing face masks and then another um, class where uh, you have no behavior or, or, or non-mask wearer. But then in addition to that, you can also have this pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions that are modifying the way disease spreads. And so you can have vaccinated class, a quarantine class, for example, here, isolated when people uh, become infected, they can uh, isolate and, and so on. And so we uh, were able to kind of um, uh, expand these uh, very simple SIR models and so that they can account for more complexity and the complexity that we see in the real world. Um, however, the math becomes more complicated as you start adding uh, compartments and age groups, and so you can just kind of imagine um, that it's, it's very, it's more complicated to, to code this kind of uh, model. And so then um, another one other way that uh, some colleagues of mine here at Los Alamos have been able to, um, to capture heterogeneity is also through the contact patterns, and this is um, there's been a lot of studies that show that most of our con the contact patterns in populations follow a power load distribution, and this is basically what a power load distribution uh, looks like. And so on the y-axis is the number of people with uh, K contacts, and this is the number of contacts. And what this um, basically what this figure is telling you is that the majority of people have, on average, you know, twenty something contacts, um, but there's very few people, and so you can kind of see here like. In this case, uh, over a hundred people or, or, or so that have hundreds of contacts. And so there are these uh, highly connected individuals in a population and this happens you know, all the time and it could be a flight attendant or someone who has a lot of contacts. And so um, through um, the, the representation of this kind of information, you can actually also introduce um, this kind of uh, information in, in your model. And so here you can, um, uh, uh, some of our, our colleagues here at Los Alamos um, explore the, um, the introduction of this, of an exponent to the, um, you have the force of infection, which I've described to you already, and then the force of infection multiplied by the susceptible class. And so if you, um, they found out that if you, um, basically if you raise the, um, the, the S over P, uh, term by some kind of um, exponent that you may be able to actually reproduce um, this power load distribution and what by introducing this in your system of differential equations what you're basically saying is that some people have um, you know on average uh, people have very few contacts and I mentioned you know 20 something contacts but very few people have a lot of contacts and so you're able to kind of capture that um, heterogeneity, and then at the beginning of the, an epidemic, usually the people with more contacts will get infected first, and then the epidemic will trickle into the rest of the population. And so um, this, our, our colleagues our colleagues were able to, uh, to show, uh, and here is for three different, different cities, Portland, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Um, they were showing here, the, there's uh, the line, there's a green line here, I don't know if you can see the color, but basically that's, um, that's what you get if you just um, use the, the simple SIR type model, but if you use um, a model with an exponent, and in this case, you know, they had a 1.7, 2.06, and two exponent, you were able to kind of capture this uh, more um, 
uh, more accurate basically contact patterns that we see in real populations. And so um, how, so in terms of uh, why do we use mathematic mo mathematical models uh, to study epidemics and, and how they can basically help um, and how they've been able to help during previous uh, epidemics. So uh, models have, are, are, have been used and are currently being used to do many different things. And here I just mentioned some of the things that we've been doing to um, with mathematical and computational models to help uh, with the current pandemic. So we've been able to identify drivers that are contributing to the disease spread, for example. Um, we've been able to assess the impact of different mitigation strategies. Um, we can also target populations at higher risk of infection. And so if we know that there are certain populations um, that are, are at higher risk, then you can maybe channel um, you know, uh, vaccines or treatments towards those populations. Um, we also have been able to estimate the growth and see how fast the, um, the disease is spreading, um, optimal vaccine schedules, um, distribution strategies for uh, these vaccines or for other, mitigate or for other uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, also a lot of forecasting impacts that you've probably seen a lot of forecasting during this uh, pandemic. And so we've been able to forecast cases, deaths, hospitalizations, and, and then also a very important uh, piece is to explore what if scenarios. Um, and so can tell you like, what if everyone is wearing a face mask? What is the contribution and impact on reducing the overall spread and so on? And so um, to summarize, I, you know, I think the we have been able to now uh, add more heterogeneity in our epidemic models so that they can um, more accurately um, capture the dynamics that we see in the population and also they're able to inform um, stakeholders and decision makers about what they should be doing in, in the populations. Um, we still need a lot more heterogeneity in our modeling, um, you know, because there, as I mentioned, you know, we have age structure models, but there's also, you can add gender, uh, race, occupation, and all this um, can add heterogeneity in the susceptibility. And so that is super important to incorporate in a model. Um, we can also um, try to capture the dynamics of transmission. Uh, to capture the variability in, in infectivity, and I didn't really talk about that, but um, we can also capture how people can be infected with different variants, and so that is also super important in, in capturing the dynamics. Um, emerging human behavior, including this information and this information, and Michael talked about the uh, the PBS documentary that I was part of, in in which um, we were talking about how. Uh, behavior can also spread um, as as an epidemic and in how uh, detrimental some of the misinformation and disinformation has been in um, reducing the impacts of uh, that could be uh, saving lives. Um, one limitation and I think uh, it's to capture the image, uh, data to capture human behavior during the pandemic we saw the emergence of uh, mobility uh, patterns so that they can help, they could help us assess how um, compliant people were to some of the lockdowns, but also, well, we need more information in uh, order to capture, um, you know, face mask compliance or mosquito repellent or some other uh, behaviors that people are adopting in order to reduce their risk of infection. And then uh, finally, I, I think the ability to couple uh, mathematical models with um, economic impacts, um, behavioral changes can also cause um, a lot of economic impacts, especially the lockdowns that we saw during the, the pandemic. And so um, I think uh, coupling our epidemic models with economic models is going to be very important um, so that we can basically weight and balance the, the impacts, not just the public health impacts, but the economic impacts. And um, I think that's all I have for my presentation. I'm happy to answer questions now. Well, thank you, Sarah. That was great. I'm uh, very impressed. And I'm actually 
sitting here, it, when you're talking about this data, I'm trying to think about the enormous amounts of data and the various places they can come from and how, how that data flows to you guys. I know we've heard about CDC collecting data and things like that. Um, can you speak a little bit to how to where your data sources are now and sort of visions for how to improve the data sources so that the models can improve as well? Yeah, absolutely. So we use many, many different types of data uh, for COVID-19, obviously the John Hopkins uh, dashboard and the New York Times uh, GitHub repositories, they have been very uh, useful in providing some of the clinical surveillance data for cases, hospitalizations, deaths. Um, we've also using a lot of the world, our world in data, um, which uh, has you know some demographic information, poverty, um, and education, and, and many other um, census type information. Um, for COVID, we haven't really been using a lot of climate, but for when we study dengue, for example, or malaria, we try to use also climate data from temperature, precipitation, humidity, all of those uh, contribute to the spread of, of mosquito-borne diseases. Um, mobility data we've used uh, to assess, as I mentioned, um, the, the compliance to lockdowns, uh, social media, and so a lot of uh, Twitter data, in Google Trends and see what people are searching for. And, and by these, um, in surveys, uh, the Pew Research, for example, has been conducting surveys on, on face mask compliance and vaccine um, uh, uptakes and, and other types of information. And so we uh, were always kind of looking for free data uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> And, and free is a, and a very important uh, piece because uh, data can be very expensive. And so uh, we want to make our models, um, you know, as open as possible. And so by accessing free data that can um, inform different parameters in our models, uh, that, that has been super useful. So yeah, those are some of the data and sequencing now with the variants. With uh, GISAID, uh, we are also kind of tracking the variants and seeing how we can use that information in our models. Yeah, I was wondering, actually, when you started talking about variants, I began to think about, you know, the traditional SIR model. If you recover, you're no longer susceptible, but we're learning that's not true. And yeah. so you have to dump all those recovered back into the susceptible, but presumably with different probabilities of being reinfected. Yeah, and you have to keep track of them. So if they're infected with one variant, you can't just put them back in the fully susceptible. So now you have to have like different susceptible classes. And so they can only go back to, you know, S2 to SN uh, because they already got S1. And so it, it becomes a more, much more complicated uh, system, but, but yeah, we, we can certainly do that and we are doing that. <laughs> That's fascinating, really fascinating. Well, I don't see a lot of questions popping up in the chat, uh, but I know that I just, I've got a lot of, uh, oh, well, there's one. Um, well, and I don't, there's the, there's the question for you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think given uh, what we've seen with the variants and now the, the two most recent variants, BA4 and BA5, um, I, I, we don't really see the, uh, the virus stopping and it's continue, it's continuing to mutate and find ways to evade the vaccines and even evade, um, previous infection to other variants. And so I, um, I mean, obviously, I don't have a crystal ball, but I do see it going um, indefinitely because the, the virus mm -hmm. seems to be uh, very smart and, and has continued to mutate. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I appreciate that you admit to not having a crystal ball, but I think we would both argue that mathematics is about as close to a crystal ball <laughs> as we're going to get. 
Um, and that's one of the beautiful things about mathematical modeling is that we build these models and they do give us some insight into what's coming down the road. So I think that's fantastic and really appreciate you being with us uh, tonight. And um, I hope that our audience appreciated it as well. And uh, Sarah, if there's anything else you'd like to say in closing, be my guest. Uh, no, I think I would just like to encourage people to consider mathematical epidemiology as, a, as an, uh, an option. And also, I mentioned already, obviously, in my introduction about uh, joining a national lab or um, just coming for the summer and just trying and, and seeing what we're doing here. And I think we're, we're always hiring and we're looking for bright minds and mathematicians and especially mathematicians. Uh, yes, to, I to come think you here. mentioned a figure of how many folks you were, that Los Alamos was looking to hire in the next yeah. year. Yeah, it's uh, 5,000 people. So uh, please send your uh, <laughs> your applications because we are we're looking for people. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are retiring, and so um, there's a huge wave of, um, and that's why we're we're trying to recruit um, new blood and new right, fresh right, ideas. Right. And uh, uh, as you started off by talking, we we all probably started thinking, oh, if we're gonna go on and get the PhD in math, we're going to end up as faculty members. But as your uh, career trajectory shows, there's a lot of options out there. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and also for professors, if they want to, um, you know, try just we, we so the I think the main difference between academ academia and a national lab is that we just do research supposed to in academia where you teach you we still have students, um, you know, we mentor students and do research with students, but we don't really teach. And so if, if you uh, would like to take a break from teaching or grading or all of that stuff, um, uh, you should consider joining the National Lab. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Very much appreciate you being with us tonight. And thank all of you for joining us in the audience. And I hope to see you next time. And uh, we'll say good night. <laughs>